Whether you're picking and grinning or just picking or just grinning, grab a drink, pull up a seat. It's time for Roots Music Rambler. Turn it up. Uh, all right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, good. Are you are you sober? <laughs> I am. Are you? <laughs> yeah, sir. Okay. Just tired. Yeah, it's been a it's been a weekend. Speaking of weekends, uh, we've had one hell of a weekend. I mean, separately, Friday, both of us, like Friday night, uh, Karen and I. So, just for for frame of reference for everyone, we're recording this on Sunday, December tenth. So, this is the weekend, and this episode is going to air. I think this is the one that will air uh, right before New Year's Eve because we 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 kind of we're okay. doing every two weeks. We kind of skip Christmas week. The following week on Friday, this will come out. So happy holidays uh, to everyone out there. Whatever holiday you celebrate, we hope you have a kick-ass one or had a kick-ass one. So anyway, on December 10th, we're recording this. This is Sunday. Friday night, Karen and I, here in Louisville, uh, went to uh, the Whirling Tiger, uh, which is a music venue here, and saw Mike Cooley from the Drive-By Truckers. And Friday night... Tom and I went to see Patterson Hood of Drive-By <laughs> Truckers here in Chicago. And Saturday night. And then Saturday night, Tom and I <laughs> went to see Mike Cooley of Drive-By Truckers here <laughs> in Chicago. So Patterson played two nights here in Chicago, Friday night and Saturday night. Well, technically Berwyn, Illinois, um, which is a near suburb of the city. Uh, at Fitzgerald's Music Club, which I know we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. And he played Friday night, and then he had a Saturday night show as well. Uh, and shortly after we got those tickets, we learned that the Mike Cooley tickets for Saturday's show went on sale. So we're like, oh, my goodness, like, <laughs> what? what is happening? Like, this is, you know, stars are aligning. I don't know. Um, so we got the tickets for Saturday night to see Mike Cooley. And it's just funny to think that both... Patterson and Cooley were in town at the same time, but they were not playing together. Yeah. And, um, and, but both shows were just awesome and, you know, very different experiences though, from the venue to the seating or lack of seating to the songs and the music that were played. So it was, it was a lot of fun though. A lot of fun. I'm just yeah. tired now. Well, I can't, I just, I can't imagine why those two guys would be doing shows in Chicago on the same night. They should have coordinated that a little bit better, but you know, it is yeah, what it is. This is the time of year that they usually tour solo separately. Yeah. Um, they'll do that for a couple of weeks before the holidays. And then we probably won't see them on the road until, well, homecoming in Athens, Georgia, um, which is February 14th to the 20th okay. or something like that or 19th. So if you're not familiar with Heathen's Homecoming, do you know what that is, Jason? I don't. Okay. Well, Heathen's Homecoming is uh, this yearly event that the drive-by truckers, um, they don't like put it on. It's just, they do a string of shows in Athens, Georgia at the 40 watt club. Okay. And um, it's become sort of like a pilgrimage for drive-by truckers fans who are lovingly known as heathens. Okay. So it's come to be known as Heathen's Homecoming. And uh, it's kind of like if you're a huge Truckers fan, this is the like the Holy Grail. It's the and thing. Okay. It's the thing. And since I'm turning 50 in February, don't tell anybody. And it looks like I'm not going to be leaving the country like I'd hope to for my 50th birthday. I said, fuck it. We're getting tickets to Homecoming. Oh, well, there you and, go. And um, so we're able to get tickets. Well, there are tickets available, I, I'm pretty sure, still for each night because they're playing like five nights. Um, and that's what they do every year. So, okay. so far, we have tickets to the Saturday night show and we booked an Airbnb uh, for a couple of nights. But after seeing Patterson and Cooley and then all of the friends that Tom and I have, I mean, Tom's been doing this longer than <laughs> I have. Um, so he knows way more heathens than I do. But yeah. after seeing a bunch of them this past weekend, He's like, we should go. We should stay longer. We should get tickets for the other shows, too. I'm like, well, A, we both work, you know, yeah. like we both have jobs. Um, 
and B, I mean, we only have a place to stay for a couple of nights. He's like, well, somebody will put us up. It's not a, it's not a big deal. <laughs> and I'm, that is so not my style. Like I'm pretty relaxed when I travel, but I at least need to know where I'm going to sleep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're going to Heathen's homecoming in February. So that's going to be like my 50th birthday present. Um, and, um, and then, you know, the, the truckers will probably go on tour, you know, after that, or maybe before it's, it's usually around like March, I would say. Right. Um, I don't want to sound, make it sound like I'm some sort of expert cause I'm not, but <laughs> it's just been my observation. Yeah. And if I'm wrong, then please yeah. correct me. It's a pretty, pretty decent pattern with him these days. Yeah. So, uh, so Mike, uh, the Mike Cooley show here on Friday, it was the opener of his tour. Louisville got the first uh, right. bid, I guess, just cause geographically he had to drive to Chicago. So he figured he'd stop somewhere. Um, but, um, but I, I was, I mean, it was fantastic to just see him and his element, just him and his guitar. I had a great time at the show. I had never seen any drive by trucker show or any drive by trucker perform. So it was a, mm -hmm. a first for me. Karen had been several times. Um, and I have, as I've said on this show, since we started, you know, I have just recently gotten, you know, really into drive by truckers and I'm, you know, becoming probably becoming a heathen for sure. Um, but I'm just getting to know all this stuff. And so being able to, to see and hear him play by himself was really cool after having listened to the catalog a few times through, um, I even had a song that, you know, I wanted him to play and, you know, would have yelled out, but I'm not like Tom. Tom likes to yell shit out. I don't, I'm not a Tom, uh, at a show. Uh, but he did not play Bob, which is the one song that I thought I really liked. That's a really cool song. Yeah. Um, but uh but that's okay he played he played you know gravity's gone and a bunch of others that i really like so it was uh, it was a it was a fun show here's my little story though this was really cool and i kind of expected this would happen and i think it's what happens uh when you guys go to see the truckers or when you're at a trucker related event because tom knows people but karen and i were walking up to the bar we were kind of walking up the street beside the bar so the music venues in the back. So we were walking by basically the stage door. And as we walked up, I see this guy getting a box out of a Jeep and turning around, hauling the box in on his shoulder. And I'm like, Hey, it's Mike. <laughs> and it was him, you know, taking his t-shirts out of his car. And I was like, Hey, well, hey. and he said, Hey, what's up? You know, yeah. and he, he walked inside. We did. I didn't want to stop him or interrupt him because he was carrying something, but it was just kind of neat that he was just there. And his wife was, you know, selling the t-shirts and, it was, you know, for a for a band that has been around as long as they have and is, you know, cumulatively, cumulatively as big as they are. It's kind of cool that you can go to a show and maybe shake his hand and say hello to him. And, you know, they're they're approachable, which is really different, I think, for a lot of folks. Absolutely. The same thing did happen to us last night at the hideout. Cooley walked in. You know, we we're sitting at the bar before the doors open to the, the venue, which was in the back of the bar. And the hideout is another one of those legendary places, music venues here in Chicago. So I've seen countless shows there in the last 25 years. But um, he, we were sitting at the bar and, you know, Cooley just walks in. He's got his guitar in the case on his shoulder. <laughs> He's got a knit cap like propped up on his head. Yep. And uh, his wife Ainsley is, you know, right behind him. And then she made several trips back and forth to the car to unload the boxes and we offered help but she's like no i got it <laughs> um and but what was cool is after the show friday night uh with patterson and then after the show last night with cooley they both um were hanging out after you know signing autographs and you know taking pictures nice. well patterson said friday night no pictures because then it just takes too long and i was cool with that because you know i'm gonna be respectful um, but then there was a woman, a couple of people ahead of us in the line who took a picture with him. And I'm like, well, I'm getting a picture. With him. <laughs> so, you know, I did. And yeah. then, um, totally fangirling. And then last night with Cooley, yep. I took a picture with him and I was wearing the Cooley and hood and Isbel t-shirt. And, uh, <laughs> so I walked up to him and I'm like, Hey, I'm like, you like my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and he was just laughing. And it's funny because I had just quoted um, a line from his song, Marry Me, to my kids earlier that day. Uh, the line, just because I don't run my mouth, don't mean I don't mean I have nothing to say or I don't got anything to say. Yep. Uh, forgive me um, for not getting the lyrics exactly right right now. But um, 
so I quoted that to my kids and I told them that he goes, well, now they hate me. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Quite the contrary. I'm like, my kids ask to listen to drive by truckers. And he's yeah. like, all right, cool. That's so, um, yeah, it was funny. And I just, I was so ridiculous, but I don't care. Well, yeah, that's, that's fine. It was, well, I just had, I had a great time and Karen had a great time. I know you guys had a great time, yeah, by the way, for, for the, for the people out there, I mean, obviously, as, as I told you, these shows will, will usually run a couple of weeks after we've recorded them. So if you want to stay up to date and see where we're going and maybe we'll throw up a live or a video here or there, uh, make sure you follow Roots Music Rambler on the, on them, their interwebs. We've got the, uh, the Instagram's probably the most, uh, populated uh, feed of that. We're on Facebook and we're on TikTok as well. So it's Roots, Roots Music Rambler on Instagram, Roots Music Rambler on Facebook, and then on TikTok, we're Roots Music Ramble on because somebody has the other one. Um, and so I had to do something different. We're going to strong arm that person. Yeah. To get the, Eventually to get we'll the make money. enough money to just buy it from them and we'll be fine. But for right. the time being, they're, they're, they're squatting on it. So anyway, but yeah, just connect with us on the internet. You can also uh, follow uh, either one of us on uh, Instagrams, our personal accounts as well, too. You can find those links. They're all over the place. So, uh, but yeah, we, we like to do some Instagram stories, do some TikToks, do some things where we're out and about. So you don't have to wait two, three, four weeks to hear right. where we're going. If you're interested, if you're not, that's fine too. So cool. There you go. And there was our, um, this, oh, can I just say this yeah. past week? So I did the Cooley show, the Patterson show. And then Wednesday, I had another show uh -oh. um, with the team. Yes, we went to the local radio station Q101 does what they call Twisted Christmas every year. Mm -hmm. And they're, they do a few nights with different acts. And we went to see Lovejoy yep. and, you know, the teen's favorite band in the world. Um, <laughs> and I went because it was a 17 and over show. And my kid is not 17, but could get in with a parent or guardian. Yep. And, um, but it was, it was great. It, they, they are such a good band, um, really tight musically, and they know how to please the crowd, which is mostly, you mm -hmm. know, screaming 17 to 21 year olds. Um, <laughs> but I was just, oh man, standing and then waiting in line for a couple of hours outside in the cold before getting mm. into the venue. I'm, I'm too old for this, but yeah. the show was quite enjoyable. Well, we've, we've lamented the whole standing room only thing here. I think we talked yeah. about it last time on the show as well. Um, for those of you, n not that this will, you know, a, a very small percentage of you will need this information, but for the whirling tiger in Louisville for the Mike Cooley show on Friday night, we, it's a, it's a bar in the front and you kind of weave through the bar to stand in line at the, the door to the music part of the venue, which is the big room in the back. And it's all, it's standing room only, but they have about five cocktail tables, uh, with high tops, you know, at the front. And then they have a line of them kind of around the back wall up, you know, above the crowd. So you can actually see, Oh, and, and those have bar stools. So mm -hmm. if you're among the first, let's say 25 people in, you can find a place to sit. Otherwise it's standing room only. And fortunately, Karen and I got there early enough and were just happened to be wandering back when the line was moving that we were able to get up on one of the bar. I was actually in the seat right next to the sound guy in the very back, oh, but nice. elevated above the crowd so we could see everything. We could sit down. So my, you know, 50 year old bad back and everything didn't have to you know mess with me the way it did at SG Goodman. But uh, uh, but yeah, that, that was uh, that, that, was, that was the sitch last night at the hideout, too. So we yeah. were able to get like a table along the, the wall right up in front. So I stayed at the table. Tom was front and center because uh, he said he wanted to be so close that he would get spit on. So we well, made that sounds like Tom's got him. some issues. <laughs> <laughs> Might need to take some of this extra Roots Music Rambler uh, revenue and uh, put him in therapy. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Oh, welcome to Roots Music Rambler. She's Frank. And he's Falls. <laughs> and we're rambling through the stories behind the music we love. And today's show, believe it or not, has nothing to do with Drive by Truckers. Uh, we have a very special guest and mm -hmm. a special story. Uh, I believe we talked about this um, the last time we recorded. Jason traveled to the United Arab Emirates last month for business, and he took care of the business that he needed to, but also 
made it a point to explore the roots of the music in that part of the world. Yep. And so tell us what you, uh, what you set up and accomplished. Yeah. So I was this, and I, we mentioned it last time on the last episode that we were trying to pull this off. That was before I went, obviously we pulled it off. So Mohammed Dohai uh, is a, an Oud soloist. Um, he is a teacher at an international conservatory for this instrument. The Oud is a um, lute mandolin type instrument that is an Arabic instrument. It's popular in Arabic uh, music. You probably have seen one. It looks like a big mandolin with a big fat bass body. Um, and it's got a curved neck. So the, um, you know, where the keys are is kind of at a perpendicular angle to the actual um, fret uh, or frets. And so, but anyway, I, I was looking for Let's find someone who's kind of a virtuoso, if I can, you know, land somebody like that, who can tell us about Arabic music and Arabic instrument. Um, and I reached out to Muhammad uh, Oud, or I'm sorry, Muhammad Dohai, who is an Oud player and teaches at a conservatory. I thought, well, if he's a teacher, if he's a professor, he's going to want to, you know, he might be interested in doing a podcast to advocate for it. He happens to also be a concert like soloist. So the equivalency that I would use is, is probably, I think I mentioned this once upon a time, it would be like having the Ricky Skaggs come and show me how to play mandolin in a, in a, in a hotel. This guy is kind of the Ricky Skaggs of, of his world. Um, or maybe more appropriately. Uh, so Jesse Wells, who is the fiddle and guitar player for, uh, the food stamps, Tyler Childers band. Yes. He, he is also a college pre pre professor. He teaches at Moorhead state university, my alma mater. Yep. Um, and so it would be like Jesse Wells coming to my hotel on his own time and his own dime to show me how to play the fiddle. That's kind of what happened. Have a PhD in like bluegrass music or something. Like, don't, something don't they like call that. him they, the doctor? They call or, him the professor. Yeah. The professor. They call him the, okay. They call him the so, professor. Yeah. Maybe I'm getting my stories mixed up. But yes, yeah. when I learned that, I'm like, see, these are the things that nobody told me <laughs> when I was growing up. Right. Yeah. Like, if I had known that, my life would have probably taken a very different, gone in a different direction. Yeah, but anyway, been. get back. Yeah, get he, back. He, yep. Jesse is as I, as I as I understand it at Moorhead State. He's kind of like the curator of the Mountain Music Museum and and things that happen there. And he also teaches some classes here and there. But at any rate, so Mohammed uh, Dohai is essentially the Jesse Wells slash Ricky Skaggs of the Oud in uh, the, the Arabic world. He lives out of, uh, in the United Arab Emirates. I was in Abu Dhabi. He drove from Dubai, which is about 90 minutes away that morning. He had to come to Abu Dhabi for other things, but he drove in and came to my hotel and did the interview. He not only did the interview and kind of showed us the instrument, which is what the show's about today, but he then like performed an original piece three feet away from me in the hotel room, which I recorded for all of you. So this is an incredibly special episode. And the reason I did that was because the original, you know, Francesca's sort of original idea for Roots Music Rambler was when she's traveling to, to understand the roots of the music in that area. Well, I happen to be in the United Arab Emirates. I don't know anything about Arabic music other than what it sounds like. And so I figured I would bring that back to all of you. And that's what the show is about today. It totally fits the spirit um, of Roots Music Rambler. And just like you said, like my objective when um, Roots Music Rambler first started in 2019. So, you know, I'm I'm thrilled and I can't imagine what an experience it had to have been being in the same room with him as he was playing and just seeing that instrument in person um, you know, but was it awkward at all being in your hotel room? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'd be, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a little strange. He, we, when we met, he came into the lobby and, and I looked around, I said, I, I don't think there's any place we can do this down here and still be quiet. Cause the instrument, I mean, it's not a loud instrument. It's not electric. It's acoustic. Right. But I thought, and he was like, oh yeah, we can't do it down here. We need to go to your room. So he even like suggested that's so, okay. So we went up and I, you know, I, I made the bed and straightened up a little bit. Wasn't going to be rude. Um, but, and he sat on the, I had a little, little couch. And so he sat on the couch and I sat in the desk chair and I just, we just talked and he started out. We, we basically went through, he was very nervous, by the way, You'll, this is kind of, a, I need to let you guys know this about the interview. He was very nervous about doing the interview in English. And so we had this really long conversation that was kind of 
the unofficial interview where he knew what I was going to ask him and he, he knew what he would say and things like that. And I would, I knew what he would say. Um, and then I agreed to um, ask the questions in English and then he would answer in Arabic. He has a friend who uh, translated that for me. So you don't have to do anything weird, but just know that there's going to be some translation in this um, this week's episode. So you'll you'll hear that. Hopefully, I've done a decent job to make sure that you can hear the English really well, and the Arabic is there, but you, it doesn't drown out anything. So, um, so That's yeah, awesome. it was a, there was a little bit of awkwardness to it, and the the language barrier wasn't really a barrier because he speaks perfectly fine English. He was nervous for no reason, but. I wanted to make sure he felt really comfortable. So that's how we did it. Yeah. And he was so generous with his time and so sweet and approachable and knowledgeable. And it was just, it was amazing. I mean, I, I literally, I texted my mom that day and told her what I had done, what the interview had happened. And I think she was the one I texted first and said, it's, it would be like Ricky Skaggs coming to my hotel and showing me how to play a mandolin. And I was just, I was on cloud nine. And sure. still kind of am. It was a really cool experience. And I'm glad we get to share it with all of you today. Same. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do that. And then, of course, we're going to share our weekly pick in the grin and where we share our picks for whose music is making us grin the most this week, aside from Mohammed Dohai, of course. Uh, might be new artists, might be old, but they'll sure be good. And before we kick it all off, though, Jason got some new ink, y'all. I did. I did. And we'll, uh, we'll, I'll show this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll edit this out so that y'all could, or I edit it in so you can see it. So this is the new, uh, SG Goodman inspired tattoo. I went to Infinite Electric, uh, here in Louisville, uh, yesterday on Saturday, the weekend we're recording this. And, um, I had challenged Cecilia, who is actually, uh, Karen's cousin. Uh, and she happens to be a very experienced and talented tattoo artist. And so Cecilia Lynn, uh, and we'll make sure there's links to her stuff on the Instagrams too. So you can find her if you want her. Uh, I had challenged her with, I love SG Goodman's song space and time, which obviously has become more popular now that Tyler Childers has, has done a version of it. Um, but I love the concept of that song and the message that song has, and that would be the lasting message that I would want to leave for my family and friends. So I think that would make a fantastic tattoo. And she said, I love that song. And we went back and forth on, you know, sort of ideas. And then I finally, with Karen's encouragement and Cecilia's understanding, I finally just let go and said, you know what? It's it. You are the artist. I'm going to give you a piece of my skin to create art on. You create what you think that means. So I had really no control uh, over what went on my skin until, I mean, I got to approve it, obviously, but I literally saw the drawing as I walked in the tattoo shop yesterday afternoon. And I took one look at it and said, that is fucking amazing. Put it on me. And that's what I got. So, and having seen a picture of it, I can attest to the <laughs> fact that it is amazing. I mean, it, it's really, I believe I even said, you know, I commented gorgeous because it is like, yeah. That was the first word that came to mind when I saw it. I mean, it's really pretty. And I was so I was meaningful. very happy. Yeah. yeah, I was very happy. And what I, the other thing that I noticed about it right off the bat was, and I, I originally told her I want those the first two lines. I never want to leave this world without saying I love you. I want those to be. I want those written on the tattoo. And she said, "That's a. It's going to take up a lot of space. That's yeah. going to be tough." And that's when I started to kind of let go and say, "You know what? You're the artist. You you do you do it. I'll be fine." Um. So. It, this was on my right leg. I don't know that she did this intentionally, but she used the second line on my right leg. So it says, without saying I love you, which means I can get the complimentary left leg that says, I never want to leave this world, and another inspired design so that there's a storyboard across the back of my legs. Look at so that. She planted a seed. I don't know if she did that intentionally, but that's exactly what I saw. I was like, oh, I can do two now. Now I got to go do another damn tattoo. But are, um, are you willing to lie there again for five hours? <laughs> I need some time. I need a little bit of recovery time. It's, it's, it's feeling pretty good today. But yeah, there was a point about hour three yesterday. Oof. And the first hour was the stencil and getting it all set up. So I was on the table for four hours. I was in there for five. 
But about hour three into the actual tattooing is when I start going, okay, you need to be done because this <laughs> is starting to really bug the hell out of me. Um, and if you've never had a tattoo, it, uh, yeah, it's going to, depending on where it is, it's going to pinch and sting a little bit. And it, there's a little bit of pain involved. It's nothing you can't grit your teeth through. And you can probably, depending on where it is, you can probably distract yourself and not pay attention to it. But it gets incrementally more painful. It seems to anyway, the longer you sit there. Yeah. And so after hour one, you're like, okay, well, I'm all right. We're, we're making it. And after hour two, you're like, this is kind of getting sore. This is, yeah. <laughs> and then hour three, you're like, okay, when are we going to be finished? Cause this fucking hurts and I'm tired. <laughs> and I got to pee. So, yeah. So by the time you get to the end and the, and when, literally when she said, okay, I think we're done with the, the ink. And I was like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's a pretty sizable tattoo. It takes up the entire back of my calf. So it's not small. Um, the other, yeah. the other tattoos I have, the one over here, I've got a Pittsburgh Pirates logo right there and it's a good size for an arm, but it, it didn't take very long and it wasn't that big. The one over here is a band. I've got a, you know, crazy band thing going on. Oh yeah. And this one was okay until it got to the inside of my arm and then it was, then it would hurt. So. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I can, you know, grit my teeth and bear it a little bit, but sure. there were a couple of times I wanted that elbow to accidentally slip and pop him in the nose, but you know. That's the way it works. <laughs> so got a new SG Goodman inspired tattoo and I don't want to jinx anything, but SG Goodman responded to the Instagram post, said she was flattered, honored. We had a little informal back and forth and I had sent her about two months ago on Instagram, a message, a DM inviting her to come on the podcast. Well, because she saw the tattoo and she sent me a message. She then saw the old uh, request to be on the podcast. So she sent me some information that may help facilitate that. Don't know if she's going to be on the show. Don't know if it's possible. But I have had communication. And knock on wood, SG we're Goodman cross might be all a future of our fingers guest. and toes. <laughs> we are. <laughs> all right. We're sipping on a bourbon and I'm out. We're going to take a quick break for a refill. And then I'm going to bring to you, we are going to bring to you uh, really kind of the episode I've been anticipating for a, a couple of months now. Mohammed Dohai, a world renowned solo oud uh, uh, virtuoso. So uh, stick around. This is Rich Music Rambler. Okay, we are. Uh, this is the moment I've been waiting a long time for because Mohammed Dohai is here and he is a soloist uh, with the Oud. And I'm just going to get right to it. Now, just a quick uh, sort of frame of reference for you. Um, he has asked to answer in Arabic. So we're going to, uh, that way he can be more full with his answers. And then I'm going to have that translated and we'll overdub. So you'll be able to hear what he's saying in English, but he'll be able to, he'll answer mostly in Arabic. He does speak English. He speaks English very well, m much better than he gives himself credit for. But he wanted to answer in Arabic, so we're going to do that, and you'll hear some overdubbing, but I think you're going to learn a lot, and this is going to be uh, a lot of fun. So, uh, Mohammed Dohai, welcome to Roots Music Rambler. Thanks for being here. Very nice. Okay, so um, I guess what I want to start out with, tell us um, about sort of how you came to be a musician uh, who were the people that taught you and gave you the love for music? My journey with the Oud began when my brother Adnan, a musician studying in Egypt, gifted me one. That day marked the start of my love for this instrument. Subsequently, I endeavored to self-learn Oud, discovering techniques on my own. Recognizing my growing interest, my late father provided books and cassette tapes of famous Arabic singers in 1996. After three years from that date, my father started looking for professional teachers to teach me the Oud, and it was the time I met my first teacher, Zaidon Sakar Trico, an Iraqi living in Germany. Additionally, I took different lessons with one of the major Oud teachers, Mr. Salim Abdul Karim. 
At that moment, my skills were enhanced and I could reach to read the musician notes and write them as well, becoming more professional as an oud player. In 2007, Beit al-Oud al-Arabi was opened in Abu Dhabi, which I joined and graduated from with an excellent degree. After my graduation, I was asked to be a teacher in the same place and am still working there, teaching and providing music performance related to Oud in different events inside or outside the UAE. That was my journey with Oud, which still has not ended yet. I, I noticed a, a, a lot of a modern, there's a lot of modern music in the Arabic world, um, which I think some, you know, Americans may not, you know, uh, you know, assume that there's modern music here, but there's plenty. And I'm curious as a musician, um, you know, have you played other inst- or played other music? Do you play other music and, or are you more of a traditionalist? Yes, the world has now become like a village. You can do anything anywhere. This applies to music, which moves from one place to another so fast, connecting all cultures. As we know, music is the language of the world and a common language for mankind. There's no need to use the language of any country. When I meet a musician from any country and I don't know how to communicate with him in his language, it's easy to communicate through music, which is completely natural. I'm sure that the way we are listening to other types of music here or in the Arabic region They are also listening to our music over there, which has had an impact on me playing oud as I play all types of music, whether it's our oriental music or western or from anywhere in the world. Just like playing music from Mexican culture or Italian, in the end, I'm a musician playing all types of music. So the the oud is a very old instrument. Um, I'm interested in the history of it. I know that it is, it's probably precedes the lute, uh, which preceded the guitar. So there's a, a lineage there that has a tie to modern music. But give us a little bit of a sense of the history of the instrument uh, and how it came to be. Yes, as I know, the oud instrument is an old musical instrument based on the drawing of ouds found on some historical walls that are over 3,000 years old, dating back to 1,000 or 1,500 B.C. So it's an old instrument. But of course, the shape changed as well as the materials the oud is made of. I believe that after that, many instruments have come to look like oud, such as lute, or mandolin. Of course, there are a lot of details on how the movement of all the instruments are. It's a very old instrument indeed. So to the uh, to the untrained ear, uh, someone who's listening to the oud for the first time, the first thing that I thought of was it sounds a little bit like the sitar from India, uh, but it doesn't have the metallic sound. Is that a fair comparison? I think the oud as an instrument is completely different from the sitar. The sitar has metal parts in the way it's built, unlike the oud, which is entirely a wooden instrument. So the sound produced by the sitar is more metallic, while the oud produces a warm, charming, and controlled sound. I think everybody loves the sound of oud. (laughs) So in my research about the UAE, which led me to you and understanding the oud. I learned about the oud, but it's not necessarily uh, an instrument from the United Arab Emirates. It's actually from the entire Arabic world. Um, So, but what are the other instruments that are, you know, sort of native to the Arabic world that people may not be familiar with in the Western world that uh, I guess, you know, are also included in music here and, and round out the sound of, of music in this part of the, the world. There are a lot of musical instruments in the Arabic world, or we can call it oriental, such as kwanun instrument, the ne, and of course, different simple traditional instruments, such as al-rababa, which is used here in the UAE, as well as Oman and other GCC countries. There are air-blown instruments such as the mezmar, and there are some instruments that are not Arabic but are used, such as the kaman and cello, used with oriental music, as we call it. And are, are these instruments heard in popular music here as well? 
Yes, it's been used fully on what is called Al Taket Al Sharki, which uses a collection of all the said musical instruments or other instruments can be added. So I've, I've seen, obviously, on your YouTube channel and whatnot, which we'll link to in the show notes so people can find it. I've seen you perform a lot of solo pieces, and you are a soloist. Yeah. Um, but I've also seen you perform some pieces with other instruments and, and sort of a band. I'm curious um, whether it's in the professional music world or just in communities where people get together and gather and play. Mm -hmm. Is something like the oud typically heard in a solo setting, or do people get together and form, you know, groups and bands and and play? As long as the music player gives more care to his instrument and keeps training, it will take him to be a soloist player, which I am one of them. But that doesn't mean that you can't play alongside other instruments and share the music. But in general, this is the role of the soloist player. Solo. So what would you like people in the Western world who maybe are not familiar with um, Arabic music or the oud or the type of traditional music you play, what, what would you like them to know about music in this part of the world and the music you know and love so much? I would then... I would like to say that it's very important to know about other people's cultures with everything that culture has, such as music, especially oriental music, which has different varieties, different melodies. And we are specialized in what they call quarter tone, the natural melodies or the low up with half degree. We have tones that have special dimensions, which are less than a quarter. So we have diversity, which is a chance that can't be missed when listening to our music. And this is the, the part of the interview where I'll, I'll say this to you, but then I'll say it you know, more straight to him. So this is where the part of where I say, where can we find you on the interwebs? Um, but uh, where can people find more of you and your music um, online? I have a page on Instagram under the name Mohammed underscore Dohai, which will be appearing on the screen. And my own YouTube channel, which has a collection of videos. Simply do a search on Google with my name and you will find me. <laughs> so that was the conversation with Mohammed Dohai. When we come back on Roots Music Rambler, we're, he's going to tell us more about the instrument. It's actually in English. I recorded it right before we went into the more formal part of the interview where he wanted to speak in Arabic. But then he's going to give us all uh, a performance of an original piece he wrote for the Oud called Raksa Sharkia, which means Oriental Dance. I probably mispronounced that, but... It means oriental dance. More with Mohammed Dohai coming up. Don't go away. Welcome back to Roots Music Rambler. We are in the middle of our interview with Oud soloist Mohammed Dohai. He came to visit me in my hotel room in Abu Dhabi last month. So generous with his time uh, to give us a lesson on the Oud, his background, uh, Arabic, or as he often says, Oriental music. Uh, could not have been more honored than I was that day. Still I am. I know you guys are probably uh, you know, feeling a little, a little fortunate yourselves to get you know, some just really interesting stuff. It's different. It's not something that we would normally talk about because yeah. I happen to be halfway around the world. Um, and as I said earlier, to put it in perspective, um, you know, I said Jesse Wells, the fiddle and guitar player for Tyler Childers Band. He's a name guy in the industry. He's also a college professor like Muhammad. So it would almost be like Jesse Wells going out of his way to visit some schmuck in a hotel room to show him how to play the fiddle or play the fiddle for him. Well, um, you know, this is what happened to me in the United Arab Emirates. So I was obviously very honored and humbled and tickled all at once. But the interview wasn't all that happened. I already kind of teased this out a little bit. I actually started recording before Mohammed switched to Arabic for the formal interview. 
and got him sort of showing us the oud and describing the instrument in English, which I think you'll all agree is not nearly as bad as he thinks it is. His English is perfectly fine. And then, brace yourselves, Mohammed Dohai performed an original piece for us just for Roots Music Rambler. I had this like one-on-one -on -one concert for a minute, so I was on cloud nine, and I hope you will be too. We will pick it up with his description of the oud, and then Mohammed Dohai will play his original piece, Raksa Sharquia, or Oriental Dance. Uh, this is um, uh, like, uh, uh, we call it um, a movable bridge oud. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the old one or the traditional one, this part should be fixed, okay. not movable. And uh, the difference is um, the quality of the sound is different from the fixed bridge or the movable bridge. Uh, also, uh, the movable bridge is good to make the old, like, give it long life. Right. Because uh, uh, with the time, you see this, this part called the face of the old is very, very thin layer of, uh, of wood. So with the time it goes down. Mm -hmm. So if it is uh, movable, uh, you can uh, adjust it. Just change the the level or some do some uh, sure. work here. This is just um, as a maintenance, but it's a fix, so it would problem. It would right. be a problem. So this is a movable bridge oud. Uh, this is the face of the oud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is we call the fingerboard or uh, in Arabic zindel oud. Mm -hmm. uh, the place that we press. Uh, uh, this is the key holder. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the keys here, and uh, this is the sound box of yeah. the wood. <laughs> yeah, sound box. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> it has different name in Arabic uh, also. Yes, um, and uh, as we see here, this is the six strings. Uh, mm -hmm. wood. Uh, each each string is doubled. Okay, just to get more more uh, frequency. Uh, not like the guitar, only one uh, string. Yes. Uh, so this is a quick idea about the wood. It's uh, fully made of wood, right. even the small parts here of wood. Right. It's um, uh, sometimes they use like uh, uh, I don't know what is in, the, in English the, the hard uh, the hard part of the um, you know the elephant. This uh, part right ivory. The ivory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Ivory, this here they use small part of ivory or something. Or uh, sometimes the the top of the right uh, of the bridge uh, uh, from ivory. Right. Yes. So, and I, I notice it has. I mean, it has three openings. Yes. As uh, opposed to one for a guitar, and then yeah. I think violins have several, but they're smaller. Yes. Uh, if it is one, the oud will, will give you more bass sound. Mm -hmm. uh, three, so you can, uh, you have the uh, two different uh, bass and uh, what is the opposite of bass? Uh, treble. Treble, yes, yeah. exactly. So as you see here, we have like uh, uh, bass sounds or treble or, right. or, or low and high. Yeah. Like this, yes. Uh, as you like, as the musician like, maybe right. they, they prefer more bass for the right, song. Right, right. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Yes. That's fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your time. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask, could you honor us with a piece? I would like to play a melody composed by me named Raksa Sharkia, which means Oriental Dance.
I'll drop the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that was unbelievable. I am so incredibly honored um, that I just got a private concert in my hotel room from Muhammad Ohai, who's the yo-yo ma of the oud uh, here in the Arab world. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> Holy wow. <laughs> that was something. It was definitely it? unique and yes. a treat. I would say, um, I can't say that I've ever <laughs> really heard or experienced something like that before. So big yeah. thank you to Mohammed for taking the time and driving from Dubai to mm -hmm. meet with you. That is really special. Yeah. Yeah. That was fantastic. And again, as, as Francesca said, thank you to Mohammed, uh, for going out of his way to make that special for us. We couldn't be more honored and appreciative of that. And a special thanks to Mohammed's friend, uh, Iman, who has a YouTube channel called M Royal, which we'll link to in the show notes as well. He was the person who did the Arabic to English translation for me. So that was, uh, that was fun. B many thank yous going around to make that for work. Sure. And man, that was an awful lot of fun. So. Yeah. Um, we've got one more little thing to do, uh, the box to check that I think a lot of people stick around for on the show. And that is the pick and the grinning segment that's coming up next. This is rich music rambler. Welcome back to Roots Music Rambler. It's time for Picking the Grinning. That's where uh, we uh, tell you the people we're listening to or maybe who we've seen in concert or whatever. Might be somebody new, might be somebody old. Just some recommendations for you to go out and listen to. It's who is who are we picking this week that's making us grin uh, in our uh, music discovery and listening. So I'll start out and just lob it over. We've had a, uh, a fine drive-by truckers-oriented weekend uh, but who you've been listening to lately there, Frank? So I mentioned that um, on Wednesday of this past week, I also went to the Lovejoy show yep. in Chicago. And there, there were two bands that played before Lovejoy. And I, I was familiar with both of them, not terribly familiar. But the first band that played is called Bridget Calls Me Baby. And okay. I'd heard... I'd heard a song of theirs on local radio, you know, in like maybe the week or two prior. And what made me like, you know, really stop and listen was the name of the band because it's unusual, you mm -hmm. know, Bridget calls me baby. I don't know the why that's their name, but you know, it, it made me remember them. So I had no idea when we went to Lovejoy that there would be two bands opening. And so when Bridget Calls Me Baby was announced right before they came on stage. I was like, oh, I know them. Like, you know, <laughs> so I was excited and they played almost a full hour. Wow. And I like I was completely blown away. And um, the sound like I read something about them after the fact that says, you know, like it's a genre and era bending sound. Like okay. you, you can't really like pinpoint oh it, you know it's it's an 80 sound or a 90 sound or you can't say that it's like a a crooner sound or like a new wave sound so the lead singer and i believe his first name is west but um his voice is magnificent and it just a total crooner okay. and i i came to find out after the fact as well that he was previously um an elvis impersonator <laughs> and so you could totally hear it, though, in his voice, you know, what a beautiful voice. And the whole time I was listening, standing there, enjoying the music and listening, like I heard bits of other bands from various, you know, um, eras of my life. Right. Like wow. totally heard some psychedelic furs in there, um, Simple Minds, um, nice. some Orville Peck. Uh, his voice sometimes sounds a little bit like Orville Peck. Okay. And, um, yeah, and just like almost, and there's another band that was really big in Chicago back in the 90s um, called Material Issue, and I loved them. My sister and I would go see them every chance we had, and they're, the, the music sounded mm -hmm. a little like Material Issue as well, not so much the uh, the voices, but um, okay. yeah, I, I, I was really blown away, and I really enjoyed it, and they're actually playing... Again, they're they're headlining a show in March here in Chicago, and 
tickets went on sale, I think Friday and it completely sold out. Wow. Well, yeah. good stuff. That's a, that's a hell of a recommendation. Who was the other band that opened up or, or do are they, are they, or are they irrelevant? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that they're irrelevant, but I just didn't have quite the same yeah. reaction. Okay. Um, another band, I was familiar with them and I already, maybe I had a, you know, like, uh, uh, what's the word, like a prejudice or something. A, a judgment. Um, judgment. Yeah. So, um, the other band was white reaper and okay. I'd heard them before. And like, I, like I told my friends, you know, they'd come on the radio and I would change the station. Mm. You know, I just, it's not, it's nothing fine. that I enjoy. Right. And, um, so my kid was like, well, you like Bridget Collins baby. And I thought that they were just okay. I really liked white Reaper. And I'm like, All right, whatever. I That's mean, what music is. <laughs> right. You do you, you know, and I just, and even, um, I posted an Instagram story and Karen even responded and said, you know, cause they're from Louisville. And so she, she mentioned that. And so I asked her what she thought of them and she says she really likes them. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, I, that's great. I just, it's not sometimes, for me. Yeah. Sometimes um, you can't get into it. That's okay. But I, I understand the appeal. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I'm, I'm, I'm in the process as I've mentioned on the show before of, uh, Karen has reminded me of some artists that I've wanted to get to know, but have it like Ryan Adams, like Jason Isbell and the drive by truckers who I feel like now I feel pretty immersed in them. Cause I'm listening to them almost every day. Um, I still need to go back through Ryan Adams a little bit, but she also is a big fan of like the cure, the Smiths, Morrissey. She was in that whole era of the eighties music where the sort of British, somebody, somebody said something the other day and called, uh, called it, um, boot, boot gazing. Uh, cause people, all the goth kids would dress in their, in their combat boots and they would sit in the audience and just stare down at their feet the whole time. Somebody That's called so them a, a boot gazing band. I was like, okay, I get that. That's crazy, but I get that. Yeah. Um, I never got into those bands. The British bands in the eighties all sounded kind of electronic and fake to me. And I didn't, I didn't catch on to them then. But now that I'm a little older and have experienced more music, I want to go back and kind of review and say, okay, well, what did I miss? Maybe I missed something really good. Yeah. So, um, so that, that, and I only say that because white reaper may not be for you and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing against white, Re white reaper. I mean, they, we want them to be successful no matter what, of course. but, uh, you don't have nobody, not everybody has to love them. So that's good. Yeah. Um, so I, how about you? Yeah. Well, yeah. So I've been, I mean, I've been gearing up for the Mike Cooley show. So I've been listening to a lot of drive by, mm -hmm. um, but I also have a growing vinyl collection. Um, and there is a, uh, a record store here in town. It's, uh, uh, Matt Anthony's record shop and Matt Anthony is, uh, he hosts a local, uh, radio show that's okay. kind of about Americana music ask on the local, uh, uh, WFPK, which is the public, uh, station here in town that plays all the good music. And I decided one day I was going to go by there. Uh, and just see if there was any good vinyl. Cause I've got this growing vinyl collection. I got a couple albums I was looking for and I went in and he was there. He was the only one there. I guess he's the only one that runs the place. Um, and I, so I got to talk to him, meet him, say hello, I'll tell him who we were and what Roots Music Rambler was. And then I got, uh, I got the Highway Women album. Uh, so I've been listening to that and I had, that's a, another area that I had not explored yet with the, you know, the, the Brandy Carlisle's and, and, um, <clears throat> um, uh, Amanda Shires and who are the other two? Maren Morris and Maren Morris and uh, Natalie Hemby. Natalie Hemby. That's the one I can never remember her name. And um, I even wrote Yola. It down Yola was sprinkled in there a little bit too. Yeah. So I, I got the Highway Women album. I also got uh, Marcus King's. I oh, think yeah. it's his first album that was produced by Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys, uh, which has "Beautiful Stranger" on it, which was written by Paul Overstreet, which is a fantastic song, which I love. But Marcus King's great, so I've been listening to that. So I highly recommend you go get his stuff. Um, and he seems to be starting to percolate to like the blow up point. He's getting pretty big now, which is good. Marcus um, King, yeah, he's been he's been like on a steady trajectory for a little while now. Yeah, yeah. And then the other uh, album that I picked up was a Muddy Waters. I picked up a Muddy oh, Waters cool. album. I wanted to have some blues to 
throw on the old turntable. And by the way, I've asked my kid, they're not, I don't think they're going to do it, but I asked, I've asked my kids for all of the components to a real kick ass, like wall stereo system, like a receiver and a turntable. And cause I've got a Crosley, you know, luggage, you know, carry your turntable yeah. thing, which I can pump through the Bluetooth and it sounds fine. But beyond my, like my camera's here, my computer's here. In a couple of weeks, I'm hoping uh, uh, right over there will be a nice big wall stereo. So I can turn off all the lights after we do a show and I can kick back and I can listen to stuff real freaking loud. So if I, if I don't get that for Christmas, I'm going to buy it for myself. And then, uh, and then all the, all the other things, items on my wish list are, are all vinyl. It's all uh, LPs. So. Very nice. So yeah, so I've been nothing, nothing new for me recently. Uh, just more discovery or rediscovery of people that I haven't listened to. So that's what I've been up to. And you mentioned Muddy Waters. Um, mm -hmm. The other night at Fitzgerald's for the Patterson Hood show, um, I met some people we were talking to and um, he, this, this young man that we met, his name is Ethan. He was talking about Mud Morganfield and, and he was going to be playing at Fitzgerald's and he's like, I really got to go see him. You know, I can't believe he's going to be playing in a type of venue like this. He's usually playing in bigger places and I wasn't familiar with the name. And so I'm like, well, who is he? What's he all about? And he's like, it's Muddy Water Sun. And I Ooh. said, oh, okay, maybe I need to go to that show okay. too. So, you know, since you picked up some Muddy Waters, maybe you want to check out his, uh, his okay. child as well. I will be more than happy to. I'll dial that up on the old Spotify's or whatever and uh, see, see if I like what I hear. So that's good. Yeah, there were four or five blues albums that I wanted to get that day, but, you know. I, I can't spend 200 bucks every time I go into a record store. You, oh, I mean, you can, but it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> well, also, too, Railbird tickets were going on sale the next day. So I had to, yeah, I'm going to go to Railbird. And I'm actually, I actually got general admission tickets for my kids because, I mean, Noah Khan's one of the headliners. And yeah. so if I, if I came home with Railbird tickets and I didn't come home with one for Katie, I would be dead right now. So, well, you're um, a good dad. I'm a good dad. You're right. I am. <laughs> Um, so Katie and Grant, I think Grant wants the other, I, I bought two general admission tickets basically for them. And then I bought Karen and me the VIP tickets so we can sit down cause we're old. Right. Um, and, um, and you know, go into the, they got air conditioned lounges and bars and shit where you, for the old people, if you can afford to pay it. So I, I bought those. So, but the, the Railbird uh, festival in Lexington, Kentucky, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's, uh, Hoser and Noah Khan and Chris Stapleton and Dwight Yoakam and Turnpike Troubadours and just Marcus King and the L King, the list just goes on and on. I mean, it's just a, one of those festivals where you look at the lineup and go, Jesus Christ. Right. It's pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, pretty nice. I went to the very first Railbird, uh, in Lexington. I think it was 2015. I believe it was. And, um, Has it been going on that long? Yeah, it's been going on a while. Well, there was COVID, so there was a, there was COVID kind right, of interrupting right. things. Still, okay. Maybe it anyway. wasn't too. Maybe it wasn't 2015 then. No, it was more like 2018 or okay. 2019. Okay. Um, but the very first Railbird was at Keeneland. This one's at the right. Red Mile, which is the Trotter Track in in Lexington. Keeneland has a little bit more space though. They've got fields around them where you can park and whatnot. So that became part of those fields became the venues. Um, so it was a lot more walking around. Red Mile is a little bit more contained, but my story from that first Keeneland was Brandy Carlisle was one of the headliners. And I had at that point heard her name, maybe heard a few songs, yeah. never really listened to her, didn't really know much about her. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to see these other acts. I think I saw El Ocro Medicine Show right before her, maybe. And I said, I'm going to stick around, watch a couple songs, see if I like her. She comes out on stage within three minutes. I was like, holy shit. Right. This woman, not only could she sing, could she write great songs, could she play her ass off, but that experience was, and I don't say this in a hyperbolic way. Yeah. That was as close to a religious experience as I've ever been in a music setting because that woman on that stage that night, like emanated gratitude. You could tell she was so grateful that everyone was there and so proud to be where she was 
and she was so into it. And I mean, I, I would, I can't imagine someone has the energy to do that night in and night out. Yeah. But if she does, she's on a plane that nobody else is on. Because sure. I didn't know a thing about her music. And five minutes in, I'm like, she's one of my favorite performers ever. It was incredible. I'm blown away. Absolutely yeah. blown away. Yeah. Her voice is like so strong and yeah. the range. She is um, a unique talent for sure. Well, and, you know, I've watched the uh, the documentary. Um, uh, I think it's on Netflix with uh, she produced Tanya Tucker's kind of comeback album. Oh, yeah. Uh, that won the Grammy a couple years ago. Uh, and watching interviews with her and watching her interact with other people and listening to interviews with her, she is just a unique bird. You yeah. know, she, she just has this like <laughs> cosmic connection with music and cosmic connection with people. And she just emits gratitude and like, you can't see any or know anything about her and not want to listen to her stu stuff. Right. I mean, she just right. really, she's a magnet that way. Yeah, so. for sure. I hope I have the same type of experience with somebody at Railbird. Maybe Noah Khan, who I've I've seen listened to his music, but I've never seen him play. And yeah. then my my daughter and son both tell me Hoser's awesome. I haven't listened to them either, so I don't know. Well, and then <laughs> Noah Khan did a song with Hosier. Um, so I wonder hmm. if they'll join up on stage. That might be very so. cool. That'd be a, hmm. a that'd be a postcard moment. So Oh, cool. and fun fact, Hosier has a newer song that is titled Francesca. Ah, there you go. Nobody writes songs called Jason. <laughs> Roots yeah. Music Ramblers, a production of Falls and Partners, copyright 2023. Our theme music is Sheepskin and Beeswax by Genta Corum. Join us online at rootsmusicrambler.com. Make sure you mash that subscribe or follow button so you remember to join us for the next hoedown and throwdown. She's Frank. And he's Falls. And whatever you do, kids. Ram along.